back, WNST, Towson, Baltimore, and WNST.net. I am back in the cockpit, back at home. I am rested, I am rejuvenated, and, uh, you know, usually I take like a week and go lay on the beach somewhere warm, but what the hell, I had nine days in a convention hall and had the roommate privilege of having this guy. He is blog and tackle out on the Twitter thing, as well as working with the Pro Football Writers Association, Bahamas Bowl, and various entities of the worldwide leader and television and such. We welcome Chris Pika back on, longtime insider in sports, not only with the New Orleans Saints, the Atlanta Falcons, Calhoun Street, Loyola, the Greyhounds, but never a Don and always a Gale at Mount St. Joe where he learned to love purple early on and now loves sticks, taking the Terps into the top ten. We welcome Chris Pika back onto the program. How'd you like that introduction, Pike? Was that good? That was very nice. That was very nice. Thank you. Well, I try to make you a big deal. I, I used to say, he was the first guy I met in the News American in 1984 when I was an intern with Mr. Stedman. Speaking of Mr. Stedman, by the way, at the Super Bowl, I got in the buffet line in the main press box where I probably didn't belong with Fudge and with some other friends up there. I got in line. I had Ron Borges on one side of me. I had Clark Judge next to him, and I had Jerry Green in front of me. And I, and I, I touched them all. We did a little you know, buffet hand. I said, you know what? A little John Stedman right here, you know, in the buffet line as they were carving the meats there in Miami. So I, mean, I did have that going on for me, but... You know, I don't want to talk football with you. I don't even want to talk Terps with you. I don't want to talk about how much you love being back in Baltimore and, you know, living near Hopkins and enjoying yourself here and the beautiful animals that your wife keeps. You know I'm calling you about baseball, dude, because it's baseball season, and you know I'm worked up about this, and I'm lathered up, and I want to give you a little platform because you spent long stretches of your life riding around on buses with baseball players trying to win championships. Yeah, I did in the minor leagues, and uh, you know it's been it's it's an interesting time for Major League Baseball and, and the Houston Astros, and uh, and and what they're going to be facing here, not only spring training, but as as the 2020 season begins to roll on. Crisis management. This is what you did. You're a PR guy. You, you know, to this day, if I had a crisis, I'd say, "Hey, Chris, what do you think from a PR perspective on this?" Because I respect your opinion of three decades of doing this. Give me a little overview. Uh, you know, give me all sides here. You can play the plaintiff. You can play the defendant. You can play the prosecutor. You can play, you know, take any side you want. But let's come at this. I mean, you're a really smart guy, and that's why I'm bringing you in on this, because you've thought about this. You read all sides. You know we're owners. You know about players' associations. You know about players' um you know about champions, you know about cheaters, you know, you rode buses with Michael Jordan, for, you know, so you know about competitiveness, right? So all of this, what are we getting right, what are we getting wrong here, and give me a little 50,000 feet on this to maybe, maybe pipe me down, maybe not, because you and I will probably have brass knuckles out 15 minutes from now in this conversation, but it just feels like Every single one of these people is tone deaf. It's all the wrong things from a PR, from a sponsorship, from a street level, from a fan level. Um, everybody's running from unions and lawsuits and all of that stuff. But Manfred calling the trophy a piece of metal. Crane being tone deaf. Uh, Bellinger being belligerent, as he should be. Uh, these creeps with the Astros all, you know, going kayfabe and said he did it, but I didn't do it, but he didn't do it, but don't blame him, and we don't wear wires. I mean, we cheat, I mean, but we would never do that. Boy, oh boy, there's a lot to unpack, and I and I keep saying this, and I'll leave you with this. I don't know that it's 3 a.m. yet in this story. I don't know that the sun has even come up yet for what the next week, month, six months, playing baseball, off-season, players association, how pissed other owners are. I just know it's all, I'm holding my nose, Chris. It's just been terrible. All of it and how it's been handled may have even been worse than the crimes, which I could you know, put onto our federal government and some senators as well. Well, here's how I, I, I look at it. One is... You've got you obviously have what the Astros did, okay? And Major League Baseball, it seemed like to me was trying to get this quickly out 
and quickly done with. The only thing that they still have left is the Red Sox punishment, which uh, all indications are that's going to come at the end of the month. So this is Uh, like you being the PR guy now and saying, look, whatever we have to do, let's get it over with quickly, right? That, that, That is rule number one is make this go away quickly. And as you know, when that is your number one goal, usually you wind up, when there's a crime involved, right, you wind up get, making it even more complicated. You know, we're still talking about Chappaquiddick, right? Well, it, l- listen, I, I th- from Major League Baseball standpoint, yes, you, you want to get this behind you as quickly as possible. But I think what people have learned in the Internet age, and at least in the last 20 years, is especially in baseball. This is not the days of Kennesaw Mount Landis. This is not the days of even Bowie Kuhn, where the commissioners wielded authority given to them by the owners. Um, What the commissioner is now in every major sport is they are the pincushion for the owners that stand behind them and pay a salary. Okay, He's there to take the hits that the owners don't have to take. Um. So the baseball commissioner goes out there and, and gives this, this spiel about, hey, you know, it's a piece of metal. You know, we put out everything we can do. And, yes, they are hamstrung with parts of this with the CBA and the union as far as what they can do to punish the players. Um, you know, and part of this, maybe they thought that the, that the culture of the clubhouse keeping everything in-house would stay intact and that nobody out that who had left the Astros organization would talk about it. And that baseball would be able to basically meet out its punishment, five million dollars, which is chump change to ownership and Jim Crane. Uh, but it's not you know, one club. It was no way it was going to stay contained within a clubhouse because of every Bellinger that's out there. Right, and, and so what I put out on, on, on Twitter, blog, and tackle, and I'll, I, it's, I kind of I'll summarize it. I said, you know, usually when you bring in a crisis PR, you have one spokesperson. Okay, if a, if a major corporation screws up. You put their you put their spokesperson out there, whoever it is, CEO, president. You give him the talking points, and he repeats the talking points ad nauseum until people stop asking questions. And that's very easy to do when someone stays on message and you have one person. The difference here is is that you have an owner who obviously has business and personal reasons why he wants to. You know, they were the World Series champion. Okay, they, he doesn't want this taken away from them. Uh, he doesn't want any stink on it. It's on there, and so you know their culture is a little bit different. You're asking players, and 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 my second point is, uh, you know, the, the crisis PR person is going to ask players who aren't going to wear that uniform all their entire career in Houston to to speak, and ultimately, you know, we always talk about. You and I have had this discussions about. You know, you root for the laundry, right? We all talk about rooting for the laundry. You root for the Ravens purple. You root for the Orioles orange. The players change. You know, it all it all circulates in and out, but ultimately you're rooting for the laundry. And coaches love to talk about we're playing for the name on the front of the uniform. Well, in a situation like this, the players in the clubhouse, those involved and those aren't, they're playing for the names on the backs of the jerseys right now, okay? They've got... You know, they have reputations, they have contracts, you know, maybe, maybe somebody down the road, this might be the difference between somebody making the Hall of Fame or not, you know, who, who knows? So they're, they're battling for their own personal reputations. And I sure as heck wouldn't have walked players out with the same press conference the owner was giving. I mean, if the crisis PR was mandating that, no wonder the players looked so awkward and it was so stilted. Because the club PR person is probably in the room saying, these guys don't want to do this. We deal with them day in and day out. You know, I mean... They, well, what they, do they, they got- want to do? You know what I mean? They want to hide and turtle up and, and, and go no speaky. I mean, that's what they all want to do. They all want to do no speaky, but there is no more no speaky when you're going to come out and make $15 million this year and parade yourself around as a champion. And, you know, this is where it gets dirtier for the Orioles, right? Like... It's terrible, Crane, the Astros, they have to go play, let's go boo them, you know, get get, get it out of our system with the the All-Star Games in L.A. this year, and it's the only time the Astros are showing up and all of that stuff. But the Orioles hired two guys based on that championship. 
Their, they, they, their pelts on the wall are based on their expertise and their genius of that championship. Uh, you know, I don't know what this means for the Orioles or where Elias and Mydell skate on this, but the notion that they're going to skate in my mind, in my mind they're guilty until proven innocent for at this point, based on what I've seen out of Houston, based on all of the evidence, based on, you know, all the codes that were going on and all the the mafia speak that went on behind the, you know management that this was player driven it was not just player driven that's obvious uh, management took the fall for it and AJ Hinch and these other guys as well and then Crane beats down on the managers that aren't there the whole thing was wag the dog to me last week and it still stands to protect Mike Elias and Sigma Dell and anybody else who had anything I, I, to do I, with I, it? I completely disagree with that. Owing to my time in the New Orleans Saints, go ahead. And this is this is what I'll say here: the Saints went through Bounty Gate. Okay, they went through a situation where you had a defensive coordinator and players that had a system in place that they were rewarding players, which is expressly forbidden in the NFL from taking shots at guys or trying to injure and basically having a bounty on on a player. That's just you just can't do that in the NFL. Um, ownership was not aware of this. Tom Benson was apparently not aware of this. The people I talked to in the Saints organization agreed with that with that notion. It is very possible that the general manager did not know this was going on. It's possible that the head coach did, and he took a fall with a one year with a one year suspension. Um, so, in large organizations of two hundred plus employees, where you have people in different areas of the organization, there may be some cross and some overlap. But ultimately, if something like this is going on, you're going to wall it off. Okay, Greg Williams of the Saints did his best to wall it off in the defensive meeting room between him and his players. Okay, it was that group you kept it in house. Okay. So it is possible, and I give them the benefit, and I'll give Elias and may have made all the benefit of the doubt here. In a large organization, if you're if you're responsible for international players in the draft, you may be walled off from certain things that happen in the dugout, certain things that happen in the clubhouse, because you're not dealing with the major leaguers, you're dealing with the next set of group, and you've got your own reports, you have your own people working for you. Could there be rumors? Yes. Uh, could you plausibly deny that you never asked the questions? Sure. Um, but at the end of the day... But would you be willing like to this, turn over your text and your email? was trying very hard to wall this off. Yeah. And in the way that they operated, they didn't want this stuff necessarily on emails. It wound up in emails. It, there, there are ways of doing it that you don't... Not all 200 people... I, I wouldn't pay 200 people that work for a major league organization with the same broad brush that covers... Uh, you know, a group of players, manager, coaches, and a GM, and a couple people in analytics. Okay, so I, I don't know how far. And again, that this week's to your point. We're three a.m. on a story, and one of my favorite things to always say is stories need time to breathe. This story isn't over with by any stretch. Um, because there are going to be other players that are going to lead that organization. This story isn't breathing. This story is gasping, right? This story is right. panting, literally. Right. But it, but and it still, pants still, every still time. Still coming, yeah. Every time still. a creep like Crane sits up and says, this had nothing to do with us winning. Boy, wow, oh wow. You know, right. that that's when John Angelos, if he's got a hair on his ass, sits up and says, are you kidding me? Like, are you, I mean, I would think the other owners, I mean, look, man, I remember taking a long uh, a train ride to New York with Brian Billick the week that the Belichick, uh, you know, monkeys and trees, video cameras thing happened. And I remember how angry Brian was that, like, the notion was we all do this. And this is the way that the industry is, that we all cheat. Like, sort of college basketball is, right? Like, they all cheat. That's the perception, right? Uh, that they're all, that everybody's got boosters in, in college sports. You know, baseball's tried to be on the up and up forever, whether it was Jackie Robinson, whether it's steroids. I mean, obviously, all of these teams and their payrolls, there is no equal distribution of the players uh, or payroll or anything. There's no level playing field in the sport 
perceived or otherwise. It's, there's, there is no level playing field uh, in any way. But this is a whole different level, I think, for the other owners, for the other... I, I've seen how angry the other players are. Right. And, you know, I, I had a conversation earlier in the week with Dennis Colazzos, and he said, well, at least this was confined to the Astros. And I, I'm, you know, Luke and I keep saying, really? I mean, were other teams not doing... I mean... Uh, guys don't take that idea somewhere else to do this or do that. And then we say, well, everybody's stealing signs. You know, I I don't know where the honor is among a a collection of thieves, literally. (laughs) You you don't know. And and that's the same thing here. You have players that uh, under the the same thing I just said about about the Orioles and, and some of the people that they've hired from Houston you have players who are angry that they're being at other teams or other clubs that are angry with of being painted with that same very broad brush and saying, well, are other clubs doing this? Well, the Red Sox apparently were doing it, and we're about to find out how much when 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 baseball gets around to, to that punishment uh, here in the next few weeks. And that's why it's 3 a.m., right? Right, and so, so a lot of those things you know, happen. I mean, listen, guys are always looking for an edge. Okay, I'm, I'm not going to lie. Guys are always going to look for an edge. You know, we had we had times in in New Orleans, in New Orleans where we saw something on tape that the Rams did on a special teams play called a pull and shoot. Okay, where you basically pull the guard and, and the guy can come through and try to block the kick. Well, they saw this on tape that the Falcons had. I'm sorry, the Falcons had done it. Uh, we tried to do it the next week, except we put a player in the way of the official, between the official and the pulling of that player, they said, okay, we're going to block the official from being able to see it, okay? <laughs> and hopefully they don't make the call. So there's always going to be little edges taken, and that's that's within that's gamesmanship, okay? This is a whole level, a, a different level of using technology uh, to, to, to steal signs, to, you know, bang trash cans, everything else. I mean... If I if I'm Houston, to get back to the earlier point, you know that you're wearing the black hat all season anyway. You might as well embrace it. You know, just the players just do the Belichick. We're talking about 2020 here, and you go out and win baseball games, and you go out and play angry, and say, "Hey, we can do this." And they go out and win another hundred games, and maybe win the World Series again. But the fact that, that the, the leadership hat. put them in this position to go out there, I mean, that the leadership of Major League Baseball gave immunity. I mean, I'm here to talk about Manfred more than I am them, like because I don't think what they've done is going to tourniquet this thing. You know what I mean? Like I, I, I don't certainly not in my mind, and I don't know if it's in your mind or not. Um, and, and you work around baseball a lot. I mean, you're in, you know, you're around the Braves, and when you were down in Atlanta, now you're back in Baltimore. I'm sure you'll be doing things in the corridor. I don't, I don't know what this has done to the confidence of everyone else because I don't know that I had a lot of confidence, but I at least thought the games were on the up and up, and they were trying to get it right. Well, and and, and, this, and, and there's there's a larger discussion to be had about that. In the in the way, and, and again, and, and I and I won't. And I'm going to let people who are a lot smarter than me, Rob and I, and other people who have a lot more uh, knowledge of the CBA and the relationship between the union and 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 Major League Baseball on some of this to, to speak to it. But I will say that you have now a segment of the population which is growing by states that's adding gambling, uh, gaming, if you will. Uh, to being able to bet on baseball games, to bet on football games in local markets. I have and, been to New Jersey, <laughs> right? So, so from a from a larger fifty foot, their fifty thousand foot standpoint, as you and I talked, you know, you mentioned earlier, that's the fifty thousand foot view. Is you know this this speaks to the integrity of the game. Yeah, Jose Altuve will be gone in eight years. Where's the game going to be? Right, right. And, and so, what do you do to stop it from happening again? Uh, you know, and, and, and doing that. I mean, people have the tech advantages. This is this is a tech society now, and you've got very smart people who work in front offices and interns and others who said, "Hey, you know, we can we can figure out ways." It's no different than trying to figure out when a player's, uh, you know, when he becomes old, if you will, and on his contracts. It's no different than any of that stuff that they're doing in analytics. There, it's analytics and predicting what teams are going to do to give you an edge at, at some point. You know, this isn't Earl Weaver and. And Steinberg, you know, writing out cards on players like they did in the seventies, you know, against lefties and righties. This is a whole different, whole different gateway 
And so gambling, uh, what that does now to the game and whether games are up and up and there are going to be lawsuits from daily fantasy players, probably more and more coming on this. You have pitchers and batters who may have been affected by this, who may have gotten one shot at the majors and they got roasted in the game because they knew the signals. So there are a lot of people that are, that are affected by it. The players shouldn't skate. But like I said, the questions are going to come either way. They're going to get booed either way. So you have one of two choices. The players are going to come out and speak and say, yeah, we cheated, which they're not necessarily going to do. They're going to, they're going to point at each other, like you said, and say, well, Altuve didn't do this, okay, because they're trying to protect him because he may have a career that may put him on the edge of a, of, of a Hall of Fame possibility in 20 years. And this may come back to haunt him. So the players are worried about their about the names on on the on the back of their uh, the jerseys, not the front. And so you're going to run these guys out there to talk, and it it was incredibly awkward. And as I said, then the crisis PR guy isn't going to be the guy sitting in the box in May first when some pitcher decides to let a slider slip, and they're wearing one between the numbers, or somebody goes in hard at second base and tries to take a guy out. Okay. All those baseball punishments, the crisis PR guy isn't going to be there. He's not going to be there in the clubhouse day in and day out. The club PR person's going to be the one that's going to have to stand in that breach. And so I don't know if ownership listened to the, the people who deal with the players on a daily basis saying, hey, if you're going to do a press conference like this, don't, don't make the players involved. Just, it's just you talking about the, the effects on, on the organization and maybe Dusty Baker basically saying, hey, you know, it's a new day here. We're worried about 2020, and we're moving on. Well, where do you put uh, that Crane press conference? Because as you know, bad. you were never going to go in as the PR guy and say, whatever you do, don't do that, right? Like, that. that's yeah, that's the months. dirty little secret of why Kevin Byrne doesn't want Steve Bishotti to speak, because Steve might say anything. And, right. You know what I mean? Like, literally, Steve is as honest. Steve's too honest. And I guess Jim Crane's honest, too. And all these guys like to think of themselves as honest. And when they say honest things, they come across as a guy that hadn't bought a gallon of milk lately. They, they, had, they had four months. That this is my, my bigger point is they had four months to come up with an appropriate response and strategy. And it really sounded like they made their decisions on the messaging the night before. I mean, you don't put your lead spokesperson out, your owner out there, unprepared to ask to answer questions or evade questions, however you want to do it, or a combination of all of that, you know, you, you, you put them in a room and you practice asking questions and you listen to the answers and you say, no, you don't really want to say it this way. And until a point where it just becomes second nature for that person, that spokesperson to stand out there, make their statement, take the questions give the appropriate amount of contrition or whatever you want to say it is, whatever your goals are in that press conference and move on. It was, you had four months and, and that's the best they could do. I mean, that's, I wouldn't pay the guy who was the crisis PR person for them. And because now, now you've, you've made it worse and, and the players, and I, I tr- trust me, the players in the clubhouse know that they made it worse. And, and now it's like, they're really wearing a target on their backs, literally between the numbers and it's going to be a long year for them. And like I said, so you know that's not going to change. You know you're going to get booed. You know you're going to get the questions in every city you go in, especially when you go into New York or the, at the All-Star game. So you either act very, very contrite and say, hey, this happened. We're sorry. You know, and you just keep repeating this, as Kevin Byrne always loves to say, the mantra. You keep repeating the mantra until people stop asking the questions. Or you wear the black hat and say, we're not talking about that anymore. We're talking about this season in 2020 and, and do the Belichick with a straight face and just go on and play baseball. That, that's your two choices. He is Chris Pike. He is blog and tackle. He is a Baltimorean and back in Baltimore. How's it feel to be like a two-time Baltimorean? I mean, that's pretty much where you are uh, from Atlanta, back living in Baltimore here. So if you see a guy uh, out there at a rock and roll show that looks like Chris Pike, well, Probably is Chris Pica. Hey, I hope to uh, get together with you at some point. Terps are playing well, right? We got Combine coming up. Orioles are going to lose 100 games. That's around the corner. And we got Preakness. So we got things happening around here. And uh, I'm sure we'll be talking about it. But I I definitely wanted to pick your brain on all things Astros. Um, I don't think we're done talking about this, Chris. No, No, I don't don't think we are either. I think this is just the 
the beginning of the story, and I and, and I'll be very interesting to see how the Astros approach changes as the season goes on and what the player's approach is going to be from a PR standpoint and from a baseball standpoint. Because, you know, like I said, this this isn't going away this season. It may not go away for a while for a lot of these guys. I think it's going to follow a lot of these players throughout their careers, and I don't think they may, may realize that yet. Chris, appreciate you, man. Uh, you know, bundle up. It'll get cold, then it'll get warm <laughs> again. But, uh, you know, welcome back. We'll get some crab cakes soon, bud. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you, it. You got it, Chris Pike uh, from West Baltimore, Mount St. Joe, Loyola Greyhounds, and uh, and Michael Jordan bus rides at the Birmingham Barons. Go find him at a blog and tackle. Doing all things with the pro football writers as well as the Bahamas Bowl. You can find me out in the buy at Toyota.com Audio Vault 24 hours a day from anywhere in the world on your mobile device by downloading the Tune In Radio app. We come in crystal clear. From anywhere in the world, all sorts of stuff going on around here. I want to give some thanks to our friends at Royal Farms. Real fresh, real fast. Uh, I haven't had Western Fries in the calendar year 2020. I got to change that. It's February. I got to, yeah, with some ketchup. I got to do that. I was just in Hamden the other day. I was going to stop in, but I didn't. I was going to stop in and see Ed and Frank. But I'm going to get some, some Western Fries and some fried chicken soon. I've had fried chicken this year. I just haven't had Western Fries. I want to make that clear. I get a lot of Royal Farms fried chicken because I eat it like over salad for lunch. It's delicious. Let's try that uh, Texas toast and the delicious grilled cheese and tomato soup. Perfect. Royal Farms, real fresh, real fast. Also, Raskin Global, doing a big event on Thursday night. Make sure you check that out. Go to RaskinGlobal.com. Get to know Leonard Raskin and the folks at Raskin Global. I've known them about a decade and a half now through sports and through the community, through doing good work doing good stuff, making money for folks. Find them at RaskinGlobal.com. Also, our friends at Liberty Pure. I'm drinking the water up here. Go to acleanwater.com and find them. Be learning about water. My water's clean. It's Liberty Pure. I am Nestor. We are WNST.net, AM 1570, and WNST Towson, Baltimore. We never stop talking. Baltimore Sports.